right now. It is costing taxpayers money. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is facing a shortage of jailers, which leads to overtime, which leads to more and more tax money to pay those often overworked employees. So the Sheriff's Office is thinking outside the box, or in this case, outside the county to fill the ranks. They are traveling across the state to recruit new deputies. Our RJ Marquez spoke with the Sheriff about the shortage. The Bear County Sheriff's Office is hitting the road to help build hundreds of job openings. What we have to do to maintain that higher level uh, is cast a wide net. In other words, we've got to go as far out as we possibly can. That wide net is taking the Sheriff's Office out west to El Paso next month as part of its recruiting Texas tour. We're hoping to knock out several the first couple of steps in the process for applicants, saving these folks about two or three trips to San Antonio back and forth. And Sheriff Javier Salazar said that the biggest need for deputies right now is on the detention side of things, where there are currently 230 vacancies for jailers. We've got upwards of 4,600 inmates at any given time, and they have to be guarded. A recent report by Detain, a jail consulting group, showed that percentage of jailer openings was two to three times more than Dallas, Tarrant, and Travis counties. The report also noted that El Paso had only 10 vacancies and a higher retention rate. But Salazar points to stricter hiring standards for BCSO. There's about a 15 step process that goes along with applying for the sheriff's office. Everybody hurting for, for applicants is relaxing their standards and we don't necessarily want to do that. The sheriff's office also recently implemented a 20 percent pay increase and a $2,000 signing bonus to stay competitive with other large Texas metro areas and surrounding counties. We're proud of the, the pay, the, the pay rate that we have. We're proud of some of the benefits that we have. We've got to branch out to let people know that this exists here. And so that's certainly what we're hoping to do with this next trip out to El Paso. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. The push for accountability after the Robb Elementary mass shooting continues today. Today, DPS confirming the head of the Texas Rangers, Chance Collins, retired in September, four months after the shooting in Uvalde, and during an ongoing investigation, the Texas Rangers, a criminal investigation branch under the Texas Department of Public Safety, that department now under review by the agency's inspector general. Collins retirement, just the latest shakeup among DPS personnel. We have information on others who have stepped down or been fired. It's online right now at KSAT.com. Meanwhile, some students from the second grade class at Sacred Heart Catholic School in Uvalde reached out to the Vatican with letters. Guess what? They got a response back. Many of these students are transfers from Robb Elementary. The handwritten letters penned by students who were shot and survived the mass shooting or by those who lost family and friends. They wrote about their trauma and how they're healing from it. The Vatican replied saying Pope Francis appreciated the sentiments and their shared stories. And he prays for their protection and blessing. It always ranks among top concerns for San Antonians, homelessness. The city seems to be making progress on that. San Antonio is one of the first cities around the country to find long-term housing for 1,500 people previously out on the streets. Camelia Juarez with the story of how a man went from homeless to housed. Alan Green was a business owner selling glass art, but when his health declined, so did his finances. So when I was in the hospital for over 100 days, um, I was evicted from my apartment. I lost everything. After spending 16 nights sleeping on park benches, Green came to Haven for Hope. He spent four months here and was accepted into the rapid rehousing program. It pays for a year's worth of rent and utilities. I just started putting that money in the bank. Because when I walked into Haven, all I had were pennies in my pocket. Billy Mahone from South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless says rapid rehousing is a temporary wraparound assistance to help people become sustainable. Mahone says rent rising by 14 percent from last year is one of many reasons why these programs are in growing need. A lot more people have been ex experiencing housing insecurity than in years past uh, due to rising rent prices, property taxes, just inflation costs in general, and even you know the wage growth not keeping up pace with those costs. Uh, so it's put a strain on the, the um, upstream and then downstream. Mahone says based on the point in time counts, there has not been a spike in homelessness over the last couple years. He says it's because the surge of federal aid funding, which Green benefited from. Green says he looks forward to seeing Social Security checks increase by 8% in January. And when you've been through what I've been through, to say you're fine, 
I'm blessed. Green continues to see his rent reduced through a voucher from Opportunity Home. Gamalia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. We are just wrapping up our third day of early voting. One of the local races we're watching closely is the race for Bear County District Attorney. Our Garrett Berger talked with both candidates about their priorities for this race, including how they plan to handle one of the hot button issues of the midterms, abortion. OK, Garrett, so what did they tell you about that topic? Well, as you know, abortion has taken on a high profile role in the midterm elections. No matter the race, given the given the consequences of Roe v. Wade being overturned, the district attorney, for example, is now going to be responsible for responsible for prosecuting criminal cases under state abortion laws. Now, the current DA, Democrat Joe Gonzalez, has said he doesn't see justice in prosecuting pregnant women for getting abortions, though the Texas Tribune reports state law is more focused on the abortion providers. Now, his Republican challenger, Mark LaHood, says all laws would be enforced if he were elected, though he says there is still a balancing act. I mean, not all crimes are created equal. Right. Even with the abortion debate, I would imagine someone would say that a 39 week abortion is different than, you know, I don't know, 10 week. I mean, facts are important. History is important, as well as the caseload and what is going on with the DA's office. And I will review those cases when and if they're filed by law enforcement. And then at that point, I'll exercise my discretion about deciding whether or not uh, to prosecute cases involving uh, a woman that, that uh, has committed an abortion. We have more on both candidate stances on our website. You can check out check it out at ksat.com. They had recently responded to your questions about the about the issues that matter to you. Now, early voting is just wrapped up for the day here at the polls. However, it is going to go through November 4th. Plus, we've got Election Day on November 8th, where you can cast your ballot. Live at the polls, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. We've been talking about early voting all week, but we also want to remind you about a deadline to submit an application for a mail in ballot. That deadline is this Friday. The elections office has mailed out 38,000 ballots based on voter applications so far. The application must be received by the Bear County Elections Office by Friday at 5 p.m., not just postmarked. They have to receive it. You also have the option to hand deliver that application. There's only one location. It's the Bear County Elections Office on 1103 South Frio. Now, if you scan this QR code, it's going to take you to the information on what items you need to turn it in with, along with reminders on how to properly fill out your mail-in ballot application. They got the clients, they got the money, but allegedly they never finished the work. Now this couple is facing theft charges. Bear County jail records show that 40-year-old Rodolfo Cuvarubias and 42-year-old Jessica Ramirez were arrested late yesterday. Both are accused of taking down payments from three people in the Holotus area in exchange for pouring concrete and asphalt. In total, they received $5,090. Some of the alleged victims were seniors. Their bond is now set at $9,500 each. In San Antonio police investigating a suspected drunk driving crash where the driver walked away in handcuffs. The passenger later died. Katrina Weber tells us why some neighbors say they saw this trouble coming. Try as he might, this is one test this driver could not pass, according to San Antonio police. They say it showed the 27-year-old was intoxicated when he got behind the wheel then plowed into a utility pole in the 5600 block of West Commerce, killing his passenger. And according to a witness, this vehicle was coming down 36th Street to make a left on Commerce and uh, coming really fast. Police agree with what Joe Reyes says he was told, that the driver also was speeding at the time. Reyes somehow slept through the loud crash shortly after midnight, but he woke up to the later commotion. I seen the flashing lights through the window and I was wondering what, what it was there in the car was pretty much just cut right in half. After the crash, police say the driver had gotten out of the car and tried to run away, but they caught him nearby. The passenger, meanwhile, was pinned inside the car. Firefighters had to cut it open to get him out. 26-year-old Joe Angel Palacios was taken to a hospital where he died. The crash left the pole snapped in two. Crew spent hours making repairs and replacing it. Right, well, it's not the first time someone hits that pole. It's the second time in about a year and a half. Reyes says with the way people drive on this busy street, it was just a matter of time before this happened. In this case, the driver will face serious charges. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. 
A teen is recovering in the hospital after a drive-by shooting. San Antonio police say around 1130 last night that shooting happened at a home on Creekmore Drive. That's not far from South WW White Road and Rigsby Avenue. Police say the teen was inside the house when someone in a car outside fired several shots. The teen was hit in the ankle and taken to Bamsey. Police are still looking for that shooter. It is Wednesday and it is a beautiful day outside 76 degrees right now. It looks like there might be some smoke off in the distance there. Not yeah, sure that exactly does what's happening there, but uh, weather wise beautiful day. Yeah, beautiful day. This is uh, that fall like crisp air. We like to feel this time of year and after the hottest summer on record, I don't know about you, but I'm just welcoming it with open arms. We had a high temperature of 78 today. That was after a morning reading of 47. Now we're in the 60s or 70s, I should say 76 officially at the airport 62 by 10 p.m. Midnight we're in the 50s and then I do anticipate most of us this tomorrow morning to be right near 50 degrees. Here's our next rainmaker. It's up near Salt Lake City. It's headed our way. We're going to have more fall like weather as a result of that and even a cold front associated with it. But have an umbrella ready to go Friday morning. More details on exactly when we should get the rain and how much we could get in just a bit. All right, Adam, remember that shot we just showed you in the smoke off in the distance? We have some late breaking news as we come on the air. This is what it was. Sky 12 over an active fire scene first reported as a grass fire. Now it seems like a structure fire, possibly near a trailer home park. Fire crews on the scene. You can see, I don't know if it started as a grass fire, then spread to structures, but it is an active fire scene at this hour. Yeah, a lot of thick, heavy smoke there. This is all happening in the 11,700 block of Highway 181. That's in far southeast Bear County. And according to county officials, there are 12 units there on the scene dealing with this. We know that the Aztec Mobile Home Park that's being evacuated right now. Yeah, this is a live picture again. You're seeing it live from Sky 12. We're going to continue to follow this developing news story. We'll be right back. I'm Stephanie Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. It's been devastating, you know, because it didn't just happen once. It didn't just happen twice. You know, it's it's been more than that. Lost belongings, extensive damage. Homeowners say that drainage problems are to blame, but they are still waiting for repairs. How Bear County is now explaining the delayed work. Plus, there was just no doubt in my mind that I had to become involved. Fighting for change by taking action. It is driving one Uvalde native to run for county commissioner. What she wants voters to know before they cast their ballots. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on the Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. Spanish is the second most spoken language in Texas. According to the 2020 census, nearly 30% of people speak it at home. St. Mary's University has revived a program focused on Mexican American studies. Courses cover economic and social issues, history and literature, and of course, language. Jesse Degollado says there was even a class about more commonly used version of Spanish that you may have heard of. I more or less use Spanglish. For example, like when we're doing something, I tell them, Andale, like, let's do this, right? In this class at St. Mary's, when it comes to Spanglish or Tex-Mex, it's not only what you say, it's how you say it. So whenever one of us is acting crazy, my friend would say, estas tripas. And not like the, the food tripas, but like you're tripping. He'll say, estas tripas. Well, my dad will say, dame un soda de grapa. And he means grape. Get me grape soda. Parking lot? Or you say parqueadero. I don't think that's a Spanish word. Yeah. <laughs> and so my cousin had to act it out and saying, Tu sabes, el, el, el pito, el pito. That's what he says it took to buy what many know is a car horn. Y'all are talking about it, and you say the pito, and you understand it, then I say that that's the proper term because it's the one that got the communicative job done. Call it Spanglish or Tex-Mex. What does it say about a culture speaking both English and Spanish often at the same time? You're somebody who has a hybrid identity. You have two cultures, you have two languages. Why wouldn't you mix them together? Still, the student says Tex-Mex is often stigmatized. They were like improper words, so it was used very informally. Only people who speak Spanglish are people who don't know English and Spanish well at all, but actually it's completely the opposite. Cuando no sabes pronunciar una palabra o que es la trans la translici. 
translation from ahorita. Really, she says it's a curious blend of both languages. Jesse de Guillado, KSAT 12 News. We want to give you a shot here of this trans guide camera. This is I-37 at Loop 410. What's catching your eye? Not the cars here, but that smoke off in the distance. This is that breaking news we've been following in southeast Bear County. A large fire that is burning in that area right now. Yeah, let's go live to Sky 12 over that trailer park. It is the Aztec Mobile Home Park, and you can see at least one of those mobile homes on fire. And you can see some, it, it does look like it started as a grass fire and perhaps spread to one of those mobile homes, but there's so much smoke, it's hard to tell if that smoke from the grass or another one of those trailers. But again, you see one of those trailers obviously in flames. Uh, you can see fire officials are also there. Again, it's the 11,700 block of Highway 181. It's southeast Bear County, but like, like we said, it caught our attention when we were looking at the I-10 city cam. And you can see off in the distance that smoke. So this is where the smoke is coming from. They have evacuated people who live here. We have a crew on the way and hope to update it before this newscast is over. Yeah, and we do want to mention as well, they are shutting down both directions of Highway 181 in this area right now. Obviously, this is happening during the 6 o'clock commute, people coming to and from. But you can bet that that thick smoke, as you saw from the much wider cam, our trans guide camera is catching the attention of a lot of people, um, even, you know, quite a bit of ways from this immediate area and, right now as this burns. And as we get this angle, you can actually see it does look like there's another one of those mobile homes that's on fire. My question in this whole thing is we have been told that this mobile home park has been evacuated, but some of these mobile homes are so close together, I wonder if they're unoccupied. And they're just worried about them spreading to some of the, the occupied trailers. But that is, that is my guess right now is that these may be unoccupied trailers that are on fire. But again, we have a crew on the way. We'll have more details as we get closer. And of course, with this starting as a grass fire, dry conditions continue to be a huge concern, Adam. Yeah, very dry, not just, of course, the ground and the grass, but also the air is very dry, which makes combating the fires a little more difficult because they can spread uh, more quickly and easily. But luckily, the wind isn't too high to spread those flames. That's one thing working in our favor. Obviously, though, we need rain uh, for more than just one reason. Take a look at our rain chances, though. This is looking good. By Friday morning, we are anticipating a good shot at rain. More numerous showers and thunderstorms expected, giving us a good 60 percent or more coverage across our area for the first part of the day on Friday. It's quiet right now. It's going to be quiet again tomorrow. The system we're watching is dropping through the Rockies at this moment. It's basically in Idaho, pushing southward down into Utah, and it's going to continue to push our way and even strengthen a little bit on its trek toward us. So that's Friday morning's rain. Looking at our future cast, it drops into North Texas very early Friday morning. We're talking by midnight or 2 a.m. And then its energy and its cold front will swing through our neck of the woods during the morning commute. I know we like to see the rain, but timing isn't exactly perfect for a Friday morning commute. I like the way this future cast in this particular high res model really illustrates what we're expecting. Overnight Thursday into early Friday, low clouds, patchy sprinkles, a brief light shower, but the main event holding off until the pre dawn hours of about 5 6 a.m. That's when the rain should become more numerous, more numerous showers and thunderstorms, and then even intensify a little bit more during the morning commute. We're talking 7, 8, 9 a.m. That's when the bulk of it should be moving through or uh, hitting parts of Bear County and surrounding counties and then tapering off by the lunch hour. By noon, 1 o'clock, it should all be east of town. I do think we'll see common accumulations of a quarter to a half an inch and the occasional or the possibility of around an inch or more for some of the very fortunate neighborhoods. And of course, we could use it. Look at the drought monitor, the exceptional drought throughout Kamal County, good portion of Guadalupe County, northeastern Bear County, and then extreme drought in surrounding areas, including most of Bear County. This type of rain event would be just a little drought denter, obviously not, not a drought buster, but better than nothing and could at least boost the aquifer a little bit. So here's the breakdown for Friday morning commute. I anticipate it to be 
not so good. Delays, wet roads, obviously active rain. So probably some delays for the morning commute by the evening commute. Just fine. A OK, clear sky, dry, just a little breezy out there. And so Friday night football games just fine. Just because it's raining in the morning doesn't mean it's going to be later on in the evening. Actually will be clear, breezy and a bit cool. Very fall like good football weather Friday evening. All right, here's our live cam. Let's talk temperatures. 76 right now, dew point of 36, that dry air in place, giving us that crisp feel. And tomorrow morning, we're expecting some upper 40s in the hill country. Kerrville and Fredericksburg, 48. Meanwhile, 50 in Uvalde, 53 Pleasanton. I think in and around 410 will be about 53 for the morning temperature, but a little closer to 50 in some outlying areas, including Timberwood Park and Lavernia and even Elmendorf. So a bit cool to start the day again by the afternoon, though. Short sleeves, sunny, right near the 80 degree mark. Downtown will be about 81, Seguin 82, but Timberwood Park, a high of 78. All right, here's your KSAT 12 hour forecast. 8 a.m. tomorrow, up to 58, and by 10 a.m., we're at 64 degrees. Then by noon, we're at 73. Increasing clouds throughout the day. You'll notice those clouds getting thicker as we get towards sunset tomorrow, and then that's going to lead us into those promising rain chances. Friday morning, just for the first part of Friday up through about the noon hour or 1 p.m. And then behind the rain clearing, but windy. You'll notice some gusty winds Friday lasting even into Saturday. But that cold front on Friday is really going to reinforce this fall feel. I mean, this weekend right near 50 for morning temperatures, afternoons in the 70s, and then by Halloween, I mean, 80 for the high. So trick or treating weather in the 70s and low humidity. That sounds pretty good. Thank you, Adam. All right, you know, our friend Larry's pretty perceptive. <laughs> I'm sure, at, th I'm sure uh -oh. at this point uh -oh. you had the Spurs 3-1 and one Absolutely. on the early season. Yeah, who didn't have them 3-1? Yeah, right? yeah, of course. I mean, come on. What's, what did Vegas say, 23 and a half wins or yeah. something like that? I mean, come on. Tanker schmanker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> These young Spurs know nothing about tanking, I'll tell you that much. Hey, it all starts with defense when it comes to the Spurs. We know that, and the young guys are buying into it. Plus, Antonian Prep. Volleyball is your TAPS 6A D2 champion. Coming up. Road, sweet road. We'll continue for the Spurs tonight when they face the Minnesota Timberwolves at the Target Center for the second time in three days. The Timberwolves are regarded as a contender in the West after trading for Rudy Gobert in the offseason. But the young Spurs still beat them on Monday night, 115 to 106, improving to 3 and 0 on the road this season. Devin Vassell led the charge at 23 points. Calvin Johnson at 18, and Jeremy Sohan 14 points. Center Yaka Pertl had 14 points and 14 rebounds for a second straight double double. The rook with the colorful hair was asked if it all starts on defense for the Spurs. I think so, definitely. Just our energy, you know, playing together. We had like 37 assists. I think that just shows, you know, how, you know. We're together and you know we're a young team so we're gonna run you know play defense spurs will play defense tonight without devin vassell because he's out with left knee soreness and shortly before six the spurs listed josh primo out as well with left glute spasms tip is set for seven tonight at the target center San Antonio FC is hard at work getting ready to host Oakland Roots SC in the second round of the USL Championship playoffs. While SAFC cruised to the number one seed in the West with 77 points, Oakland grabbed the seventh and final playoff spot with 46 points, and they still barely got in, only because their goal differential was one better than El Paso. But in the first round of the playoffs, Oakland stunned the West two seed San Diego Loyal SC, winning 3 0. Strong opponent. You know, got to give them their respect. You know, beating the the second place team in our conference, that's, that's not an easy job. And doing it by three goals is also, it's not easy. So, you know, obviously we respect them, but, you know, we got to go in knowing what we can do and knowing who we are. SAFC will black out Toyota Field for the team's Western Conference semifinal versus Oakland Friday night at 730. All fans are encouraged to wear black SAFC clothing alongside the team's blackout kit, which will be worn on the field. And Tony and Prep Volleyball is having a fantastic regular season, which ends next week for them, and then it's time for the playoffs. The Apaches are 35-11 and 11 overall and 10-0 and in TAP 6A District 2, the league's only undefeated team. Thanks to reclassification, Antonian is playing in a bigger and much tougher district this season, which also features five teams from the Houston area, as well as San Antonio Incarnate Word. With two regular season matches left, the Apaches have already locked up the district crown 
and that's a great feeling. I think that this year it like means a lot more. It, like I, in a way, like it proves us. Like it gives us, I don't know. Like last year it was a lot easier I think than this year, and it's just to know we played harder teams and still won district is like a really good feeling towards us, and it gives us a better feeling going into playoffs. You know, seeing those harder teams, some of them we've already seen. You know, it really means a lot. Um, coming into this year, we knew we were going to face Houston teams, and that was definitely a big change for us because um, for the past, I don't know how many years, we've been in a smaller district, and it hasn't been too competitive. So coming into the Houston district, knowing it's going to be a lot of big schools and just taking it 10-0 um, right now, um, it feels really great. Antonian is hosting Incarnate Word right now. The match started at 6, and then they'll close out the regular season Tuesday at Houston Incarnate Word. All right. Thank you, Larry. You got it. Perceptive as always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, straight ahead. We're still following that late breaking news in Southeast Bear County. A big fire burning there. We're going to have the latest after the break. I want to go back again to that breaking news we've been covering since the beginning of this show. You can see they now are putting some water on one of these mobile homes. That actually looks like an RV. This is in the 11,700 block of Highway 181 in far southeast Bear County. This is a much better picture than what we saw just moments ago. Yeah, it looks like that smoke is lessening somewhat. This was reported as a grass fire first, but of course it has now spread to these structures here. The Aztec Mobile Home Park, uh, they have evacuated this area. The highway 181 is being shut down in both directions. We do have a crew that is trying to get to this scene, but of course they are stuck in traffic right now along with a lot of other people because of this heavy smoke in the area and the road closure. Again, the Aztec Mobile Home Park, that's where this grass fire spread and it has now been evacuated. Yeah, and you can actually see there are still hot spots, though, throughout those those mobile homes that you see there. You can see flames uh, on. It looks like one of those mobile homes basically burned out at this point. It's just a shell of itself. And then as you look further up the screen through the smoke, you can also see that there is, again, some uh, fire, some hot spots there. Firefighters. Calling in a ladder truck, certainly getting the upper hand here, but uh, this is something we're going to continue to watch at least through the next 25 minutes. Well, President Joe Biden taking new steps. He says we'll help keep money in the pockets of millions of Americans. Today he announced a new crackdown on so-called junk fees like surprise bank overdraft fees. ABC's M. Wynn gives us the highlights from his remarks as we're less than two weeks away from Election Day. Less than two weeks before Election Day, President Joe Biden announcing new actions aimed at lowering costs for American families. To put more money in the pockets of middle income and working class Americans to hold big corporations accountable. The president vowing to reduce or eliminate billions of dollars in what he called junk fees, including banking overdraft fees, credit card late fees, and hidden hotel booking fees. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau released new guidance to ensure banks and corporations don't engage in unfair and unlawful practices. Biden using the example of a parent receiving a check that bounces. You could charge 15 bucks. It's wrong. It's ridiculous. It's unfair. My administration is making clear today it's illegal as well. Biden acknowledging there are economic frustrations nationwide while reminding Americans that inflation and gas prices have dropped since this summer. We're seeing in the economy of 10 million new jobs and unemployment of 3.5 percent. Gas prices are continuing to go down. But as the midterms near, a Reuters Ipsos poll found Biden's approval ratings have slipped since last week as consumer confidence is waning, according to the conference board. My cell phone is disconnected because I can't pay the bill. They say we're not in inflation, but it's economically, it's hurting us. Whether you call it whatever you want to name it, it's, it's hurting all of us. Those concerns driving Republicans' growing chance to take back Congress. But President Biden's remarks today at the White House mark another attempt in the last stretch before Election Day to show voters he's focused on turning the economy around. The Consumer Financial Protection Act prohibits unfair practices when consumers cannot reasonably avoid them. That's the law Biden is utilizing to crack down on banks and big corporations. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. A verdict has been reached in last year's Waukesha, Wisconsin Christmas parade attack. A jury found Daryl Brooks guilty of six counts of first degree intentional homicide. 
In November of 2021, Brooks drove his SUV into a crowd at that parade, hitting 68 parade goers. The six killed included an eight year old boy and several members of the dancing grannies. Dozens more were injured. Brooks also convicted of 61 counts of recklessly endangering safety with the use of a dangerous weapon, his vehicle, six counts of fatal hit and run and other charges. The trial marked by the suspect's unusual decision to represent himself in court. The fate of the last Confederate statue in Virginia has now been decided and it will come down. The statue of General A.P. Hill is the last Confederate monument in Richmond. It's been standing there since 1891. A lawsuit was filed by Hill's descendants because the general's remains are actually buried underneath that statue. They argued it should be considered a grave marker and their property. The city countered, saying it is the sole owner and it wants to remove and relocate the statue to the Black History Museum. A judge ultimately ruled in favor of the city and that statue will be taken down and relocated along with those remains. Well, it's no longer making headlines, but people in Jackson, Mississippi still dealing with a water crisis. A church launched a Check Your Tap event for people to sign up for free for water testing. It was available for the first 100 people and businesses. They also got a case of bottled water. The water crisis began after heavy rainfall in late August, exacerbated problems at the city's main water treatment facility. Since then, many people have had to boil all the water they use. I signed up. I can't wait to get the, the information. Come and test my water because I don't drink it. I think that it will be a good idea to have it checked because right now I'm really afraid to drink water. We really need this them to get this water situation under control. The water testing will be done by the National Clean Water Collective who did similar testing in Flint, Michigan. We'll be right back. This weekend is Dia de los Muertos, two days to honor the souls of loved ones who have passed on. And leading up to that, we've been sharing a lot of local memories. Our Jonathan Cotto spoke with a woman whose grandmother was a dedicated practitioner. She shows us the altar that her family is building. Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is more than just an annual holiday for Karina Gil. It's a family tradition with a spiritual connection. The Altar de Muertos for us is something very symbolic. It's very, it's more of a celebration of life. It's something to, that we remember the ones that they, they're gone. Her abuelita, Alamar Chapa, passed away on June 15th at 98 years old. She was almost 99, a few months short. She was very traditional in honoring our ancestors. Um, maybe because of the age that she was, she wanted to have her altar. She wanted to, just the way someone else made her day at Dia de los Muertos by building an altar. She attended every Muertos Fest for the last 10 years. Now I think it's my time to build that altar. Gil has been hard at work constructing her altar for the past three months. It's a lot of work, a lot of dedication. I come from work and probably like every single day I spend like five hours, just every single day, every single night, drawing it, painting it, Read the sign in. Each altar is unique in its design, but all must have the ofrenda as its central component that has key elements needed for the soul's journey. It's going to have the salt, which represents purification of the soul. It's going to have the mirror uh, for them to see themselves. And it's kind of like a way for them to remember that they're not here any longer and that they have to return back to where they're coming from. There's also water to kind of like crunch like their thirst when they come over. For Alamar Champa, Dia de los Muertos was about familia, honoring traditions and keeping memories alive. By me making this altar, I really hope that there's a kid, a family that they will go and see an altar and that they will remember their roots, where they're coming from, their culture, and above all, the family. Jonathan Corto, KSAT 12 News. We want to go back to that breaking news we're following in Southeast Bear County. This is a mobile home park where a grass fire spread late this afternoon. Crews have been there on the scene. 
We are starting to see this smoke turn a lot more white in color, lighter in nature. So uh, certainly an effort of firefighters out there to try to get this under control after this area, this mobile home park has been evacuated. Yeah, and it looks like it's a mixture of mobile homes and RVs. Uh, we saw what looked like an RV that was on fire. Uh, from the other direction. There's also a grass fire. We believe that the grass fire spread to this Aztec mobile home park. Uh, we know that traffic has been closed down, but we know a lot of people can see this throughout the city. Our Patty Santos is on her way to the scene right now. Patty, are you seeing the smoke from where you're at? Yeah, definitely. We were actually in the Leon Valley area, and you could just see the huge plume of smoke, which is I mean, about 40 minutes away from where we were at that time, and you could definitely see uh, the black smoke as we get closer to downtown. You can see uh, the skyline uh, is pretty dark in the background, uh, but we are on the way. We know that uh, Highway 181, at least parts of it, as you get closer to that area, are shut down or being shut down right now. So we're going to definitely try to get as close as we can to that area and bring you more information as we get it. So we'll send it back to you. Yeah, of course, we'll have you covered on air and online. Thank you, Patty. And as we go back to the live video from Sky 12, live picture from Sky 12, and you see that, that now it looks like they have two ladder trucks that are on the scene. They only had one earlier. That gives them a more of a bird's eye view to get some of these hot spots taken care of. But you can see there's still active flames on the scene right now. Yeah, and just across the road there, uh, off towards the back of this view, it looks like there are several more mobile homes. And I, I would venture to guess that a lot of that area has been evacuated as well. And Steve, you pointed out that the area where this fire is happening right now, it looks like there are some RVs, maybe even some other storage containers of some kind uh, where this grass fire has now spread. But this is certainly something that crews have been working on for the better part of an hour now out here in Southeast Bear County. Yeah, and, and you, you make a good point there, Myra, because I think the, the Aztec Mobile Home Park that we're talking about is what's on the other side of the street there. I believe mm -hmm. it has been evacuated because they are concerned that what's happening here, which frankly looks more like a storage lot or maybe a repair lot. Right. Like you said, there are store, there are, you know, trailers that are really close together. There's an RV that you see there. There are looks like storage containers there as well as we get more of a shot as we swing around here to give you kind of a better idea. But the concern is, I mean, we believe this started as a grass fire and spread to some of these structures. And uh, it looks right now like fire officials have this area surrounded. And just off there, uh, and from this angle, you can see there is a grassy area. There is a, a wooded area back off in the distance. And that, I would presume, is where potentially this fire started, then spread to these structures in what looks like this storage area, a place where there may be equipment, um, industrial equipment of some kind. So certainly dry conditions that we've been dealing with are helping fuel that. Yeah, and I just got uh, confirmation from our newsroom. We are getting calls in from people who live in this area. This is not the mobile home park itself. I think that is what we're talking about just on the other side of the road. This is near that mobile home park. Like I said, perhaps a storage yard or a repair yard or something like that. But they have evacuated the mobile home park as a precaution because this fire was spreading so rapidly, you know, just 50 minutes ago. All right, so that's some good news that we have learned. Obviously, people in this mobile home park being affected across the road there as they're having to leave their homes, but their homes not affected immediately by this fire. No homes burning uh, at this time, but certainly, like we've pointed out, some storage areas there, potentially some RVs that may be stored on this lot there. So that's something that we have clarified as crews are out there and we have our own crew, our Patty Santos, you just heard from, trying to make her way there. But again, uh, Highway 181 near this area shut down in both directions because of this ongoing firefight. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So much needed rain is on the way, though the timing may not be ideal. Let's talk about an upper level systems moving in from the color, the Rockies, basically just over Colorado right now, causing some higher elevation snow. Once it gets here, it's going to strengthen a bit and push a cold front through our neck of the woods. So Thursday night into the pre dawn hours on Friday, just some sprinkles and light showers. You see 2 a.m. here, I think areas of very light rain. But once you get closer to the morning commute on Friday, that's when we're expecting 
some heavier showers and thunderstorms to develop and some pockets of heavy rainfall. So anticipate disruptions to the Friday morning commute. But by the afternoon and evening, just fine. Actually, we'll clear out into the Friday afternoon. I think we'll see common rainfall amounts between a quarter and a half an inch with the potential of some locations getting around or even just upwards of an inch of rain. So cross your fingers for your neighborhood. So the morning commute on Friday delays wet roads evening commute just fine Friday night football just fine as well. It's going to feel fall like good football weather a little breezy at times tomorrow sunny and 53 in the morning. Then by the afternoon we make it up to 80 degrees for the high with some increasing clouds. And again that rain is just for the first part of Friday pre dawn hours before sunrise all the way up through noon. Then we clear out and we'll actually have a beautiful fall like weekend mornings near 50 afternoons in the 70s trick or treating on Monday 70s and low humidity. Another look at that fire in Southeast Bear County. Expected update on air and online. See you on the night beat.